guys, welcome back to another edition of Chats from the Blog Cabin. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Chad Dumas. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter to me as, as long as you don't put another S at the end of my uh, last <laughs> name. Dumas is fine. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about some educational stuff, but before we get into that, introduce yourself a little bit. Let us get to know you a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I was born and raised in Nebraska, spent most of my career there, um, was started out as a music director in Lincoln Public Schools at a middle school, um, and then I spent some time at a, uh, as a professional developer in, in, uh, in the Intermediate Service Agency, then I was a secondary principal, and then a central office administrator as a director of learning in South Central Nebraska. And then a few years ago, my wife and I, uh, we became empty nesters overnight, where my uh, our, our oldest son went to Israel for a year, and our youngest son um, became a foreign exchange student in Germany. And so we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we never intended to spend our life in Nebraska, and here we are. Uh, maybe we should go someplace else to do something different. And so Iowa <laughs> was the uh, someplace different for us. And so we went to Ames, Iowa, and I was the executive director of elementary education there. And then uh, recently, as you know, with the pandemic and everything last summer, decided, you know what, I've been toying around with doing consulting and writing a book and decided, let's jump in with both feet here. And um, so I uh, wrote a book last summer and a second one this last fall. And I've been consulting with schools and districts around the country and world, actually, uh, and helping to uh, build a collaborative environment uh, because we know that uh, when we as educators are working together, uh, as educators and then partnering with families and communities that that's how we can have the biggest impact on kids and their learning so uh, so that's uh, yeah a little bit about me and my work wow and you know when you start talking about music for a while there i was an interim music teacher and i also taught elementary school to, so i know exactly where you're coming from and the change from the kids too it's like they're d night and day like now parents aren't as involved as they used to be i don't know if it's because parents are their either single working parents or, or both parents are working and they just don't have the time to get involved anymore. Don't you agree? Yeah, you know, I, I, I seems like there's like a trend that like middle, elementary uh, parents can be very involved in elementary school. And then somewhere around middle school, um, and you know, from the lens of an educator, I think of ourselves as a school system, uh, we don't really know how to meaningfully engage parents and and things start to shift and we struggle more at the secondary level with really trying to meaningfully engage parents. It doesn't mean it can't be done, but it is more of a struggle as, as kids get older. So did you always want to be an educator? Did I always want to be? No, no. Uh, you know, I started out, I think probably uh, like most uh, young boys, you know, wanting to be a firefighter and a police officer. Uh, and the firefighter thing lasted for quite a while, probably well into middle school. Um, had, you know, toyed around with being a scientist, but then, you know, you got to know a lot of math and that kind of scared me, even though I was also a double major with math at university. It, you know, when I was thinking about that middle school mm -hmm. age, you know, that was scary. Uh, but I think what led me to be uh, an educator was two things. First of all, uh, I love music love music, um, but I also knew, piano was my major instrument, um, but I also knew that I wasn't good enough to be uh, a performer. You gotta be really, really good to make it uh, big time. And I knew I wasn't gonna be able to make that. And I had some amazing high school teachers and a band director who I saw what he did and how he was able to engage kids. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I can use my love for music and uh, leverage that to impact the future generations um, through education. And so, so yeah, so that's, that sent me there. And then I was a middle school music teacher. You know, you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, being an elementary stuff, you know, middle, middle school teachers were a little crazy anyway, you know, a little bit different. Yeah, for <laughs> than, sure. Than most. That's a whole nother battle that you're fighting in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, kids come in. Uh, I had my cooperating teacher when I was student teaching. He said, you know, they come in sixth grade and parents kind of like they want to drop them off for three years and then pick them up, you know, when they leave as ninth graders. But those of us who are middle school teachers, we'd love it. You know, the enthusiasm and energy and creativity and spunk that uh, goes along with uh, those middle school ages. So why did you decide to start? be a teacher and then go up the field to keep going up further and get out of, basically get out of teaching and start doing the administrative stuff. Yeah. 
So early on, uh, when I was teaching uh, across the hall, the art teacher, Diane Gablehouse, I don't know if she listens to your show, but I'll send this to her so she can make sure to listen. But she early on said to me, you know, you should be a principal. And uh, I looked at her, I said, no way, that's uh, crazy. I don't ever see myself being a principal. And uh, after a couple of years, started to see the impact that leaders, school leaders have on their school and started to think, yeah, you know what, maybe I, I can have a bigger impact on more students, on more families, on more teachers. And so I uh, started to then uh, pursue that master's degree and, um, and then doing professional development for an intermediate service agency where we served lots of school districts. I think there were 30 some school districts with 30 some thousand students, um, ranging from like 80 kids, K through 12, all the way up to over 10,000 kids. So these are, you know, a wide Ooh. range of school districts. Wow. And, um, and, and again, I just saw the impact that principals have on their schools. And so that's when I decided, you know what, I really do need to serve in that principal role and then serve in a central office role where I can then serve the principals who are doing that work and help the principals do their job more effectively. And of course, that's what I'm doing now. You know, my work is around how to help building principals do their job better. Of course, I work with teachers as well as part of that process, because teachers are absolutely critical and important in, in the work of improving student learning and improving our systems. Um, and, and my focus just has been um, on building that leadership capacity, how to be a better leader. So let's talk about that. So how do how do you market it? How do people know about it? What do they need to do to enroll in it? Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, I've got, you've got my website on there. Um, and then uh, a huge emphasis of mine recently has been this book. Um, and I titled it, Let's Put the C in PLC. Uh, and PLC is jargon in the educational world. Uh, it stands for Professional Learning Community. And so uh, the C is community. And so mm -hmm. the idea is, how do we put this community a collaborative community into our workplace environment. And it grew out of my work um, on my dissertation, which received some international accolades for best research awards uh, when it was written. And the, the, the research was around, okay, what does a principal need to know in order to build a collaborative environment for teachers? Now, some of your listeners might be saying, well, why is it important to have a collaborative environment for mm -hmm. teachers? There's about 50 or 60 years of research that says that if we want to improve learning for students, get the teachers working together collaboratively to improve mm -hmm. their practice and results for students. Like there's a lot of people who talk about silver bullets, this or that to improve student learning, right? Vouchers or charter schools or this or that. And there's lots of different mm -hmm. innovations in education. There's one thing that's been proven over and over and over and over again get teachers working together. And the role of the principal in that is key to create that environment. Mm -hmm. And so I identified from the research 10 elements of what a principal needs to know to be able to create this collaborative environment. Now, it's not just the principal, there's a lot of people who are involved, mm -hmm. but, but it's this idea of these 10 elements of what it takes to build a collaborative environment um, to improve uh, student learning. So that's kind of a long way around, you know, asking this question of, you know, what's my work about or how do people get involved? Mm -hmm. So so I wrote this book um, and it's been well received. And um, then very shortly after writing the book, my publishing guide and, and some of the people who had read it, who'd been reading it said, you know, maybe you should write an action guide to help mm -hmm. us uh, translate um, what's been written into reality and action. You know, this is okay. This so this is nice to know, but how do I actually <laughs> put it into yeah. action? And so that's where the action guide came in, and then and then workshops and trainings around this, where um, I you know share the content with school leaders, and then we engage in that content together. We implement plans of action to change our practice and improve our cultures for teachers. And as part of that, then I coach those principals mm -hmm. and school leaders with one-on-one -on -one intensive coaching sessions to help them translate what's written into reality and action. And then we come back together at the, the end, all of us, and, and, and reflect on what's our learning been like, what are our next steps, and, and most importantly, uh, well, I shouldn't say most important, importantly as part of that also is, okay, so what, um, how do you effectively lead change in our organizations? Because we know that you know 
schools have were created, you know, 150, 200 years ago, they really haven't changed mm -hmm. a whole heck of a lot. And so building yeah. a collaborative environment is a change. And so how do we lead that change to be to be effective? Now you're talking about collaborative environment. What about with the pandemic going on right now? That's kind of, you know, that's kind of hard trying to build a collaborative environment with this pandemic because there's some schools that are going all virtual. There's some schools that are like in our school district until like I think until March, there are certain kids that go two day the first two days of the week and then there's certain kids that go the last two days of the week and then Wednesday nobody goes to school and everything's all virtual. So how do you build a collaborative um, relationship that way? Yeah, it's it is more challenging. And um, so so that two things come to my mind in this regard. So one is the book was written with that in mind. Uh, and so throughout the, the course of the book, there's a presentation of the, the research, if you will. It's, you know, just short little nuggets. There's extra resources if you want to go dig into some more things. There are checklists to like self-assess. What do I know and what do I don't know? And then there's stories. And those stories include elements of what's it, how do you build this collaborative environment in a pandemic or in remote learning environments? So, so that's the first thing that comes to my mind is this idea of the book was really written in that with that in mind. And then the second thing is we don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the inequities in student learning have always been there. And the pandemic has exacerbated those, right? They've made yeah. them bigger. And so if if we had an excuse to not work together before, uh, we don't anymore because we have to uh, rise to the challenge to help meet the needs of these kids. And then the, the I, I lied. I said there were two things that came to mind. There's three things that came to my mind. The third thing that comes to my mind is that the this uh, these processes and ideas and tools really work for any environment. Um, I've been fortunate to actually engage in some work with people thinking about how do we take these ideas and translate them into like in marital relationships mm. with husband and wife or with a family or churches or uh, businesses or nonprofits and taking these ideas and how do we build a community mm -hmm. in all of our uh, relationships. So let's talk about some of the ideas. Can you throw a few examples out? Yeah. So um, the, the first element is something that I think personally is the most important, uh, even though the research doesn't say, hey, make sure this is the most important. I personally think it is. And that is the idea that uh, charismatic leadership is not the same as what you need to be able to have long term success. Even though many of us think charisma is really important, it really is not. So if charisma is not important, what is? Relationships, relationships, relationships. And so how do you develop relationships that are meaningful? And, and you know, it's one thing to say relationships are important. It's another thing to actually be able to develop those. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never met a person who has said, relationships, they don't matter. I, I'd like to meet that person. I don't, I've never met them because every person I've ever met has said, mm -hmm. yeah, relationships matter. And you and I both know, and all your listeners know that there are some people out there that are pretty bad at building relationships. And yeah, there are those true. that are pretty amazing. So what makes for quality relationships? And there's several things that come to mind with quality relationships and um, two, two big areas. One is around developing um, what what I refer to as personal clarity. So personal clarity around um, my goals mm -hmm. and around the language that we use and the actions. And the example that I like to give with this, this idea of clarity, is some of the people who I have the best relationships with are around sports. Mm. And with sports, there, there are goals associated with that, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a Nebraska football fan. A, a winning season would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so right, but there's goals, right, that are associated with athletics. Yes. Whether it's games or points yes. or uh, wins, yes. losses, yes. divisions, yes. whatever. There's also yes. language yes. associated yes. with those yes. relationships. Mm -hmm. Things like like you go to a, a again Nebraska. I go to a Nebraska football game. 
and any football game in the entire country, before the team takes the field, there are certain rituals that happen. There's songs that are sung. Mm -hmm. There's hand movements and arm movements and gesture. Like, like there's a language around this event and there's clarity with that. Yeah. And then there's actions that go with it too, right? After a touchdown, everybody high fives or, you know, some teams do so many push-ups or backflips or whatever, right? There's, there's yeah. actions that take place. And so these relationships are founded on those three ideas, clarity around language, clarity around goals and clarity around actions. And so relationships with everybody, if we think about it that way, what are, what's the language that I use with my spouse, with my children? with mm -hmm. my work colleagues, with my church colleagues or faith-based community, right? right? Language, goals, actions, you just go through those and think, okay, to what extent do we have commonalities? And that will be, give you a pretty good clue as to the quality of the relationships. Mm -hmm. The other, the second big area, so that's one, personal clarity. The second big area around positive relationships comes down to certain skills or behaviors that we all employ. Mm -hmm. um, and I call them the three plus one. And I should have called it the one plus three because the one comes first and then the three, but <laughs> you know, three, three plus one sounds better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the plus one is building an environment of rapport where we're physically in rapport with each other. There's some great uh, if you just like Google videos on rapport, I think Tony Robbins has some little like two minute descriptions. The idea that when when you and I are in rapport with each other, our body language, our nonverbals start to mm -hmm. sync with each other. Yep. They don't they don't mimic, but they start to mirror each other. Head motion, volume and intensity of our voices, hand movements legs crossed, you know, those types of things start to manifest themselves. So people who are in relationship with each other have rapport. That's the plus one. Now the plus, the three part of that are three skills, pausing, paraphrasing, and posing questions. Okay. That to build better relationships, if we engage in those three skills that will improve our relationships. And, and it reminds me of, you know, marriage counselors or relationship counselors. Mm -hmm. When, when you're in those settings, they will forcefully, I mean, they won't forcefully, they will force you to pause. Yeah. Right. They, will, they, they will. will say, okay, Melissa, it's Chad's turn right now. Let Chad speak. And so Chad, blah, 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 blah. And Melissa tries to jump in and no, Melissa, it's yep. Chad's turn. Let Chad speak, right? And then once Chad's done, then, okay, Melissa, will you please summarize what did Chad just say? Mm -hmm. That's paraphrasing, right? And this entire process is about building better relationships. Pausing, paraphrasing. What I haven't seen in, in relationship type um, counseling is then the questioning or posing questions, you know? So tell me more about, or when you mm -hmm. say this, what are you thinking? Um, and so those these skills we can and should use with everyone, pausing, paraphrasing, and posing questions, not just when we you know, are needing relationship counsel or advice. This yeah. is something that we should use all the time. So, so those are some of the, the big ideas around uh, building positive relationships and how to go about doing that. Well, when you were talking about using those skills all the time, I could think about parenting, you know, when you, cause I have three girls so and my girls are ages um, 25 to 18 now, but when they were growing up, you're like, okay, no, it's her turn to talk. Okay. Now, especially when you're trying to referee a fight, you, that was really great for a parent to use as well when you're trying to referee a fight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these skills are just really important skills that and like I said earlier, you know, I, I found uh, that some others are saying, you know, I wonder how we can take these ideas. You know, I've done the research in terms of mm -hmm. education, but they very much apply in other fields. And so how can we apply these ideas to our discourse in society? Uh, and some really interesting conversations lately in terms of the um, uh, racism discourse. You know, how do we how can we address issues of racism? Well, my opinion is it starts with relationships and yep. we need to be able to listen to each other to be able to address any difficult issue, especially those that are so uh, core to identity, uh, which is what uh, race race really is. It's, it's key um, 
part of our identities. So how do we become better listeners? Because there's a lot of people in society that don't want to listen to what everybody else says. They, it's their way or no way. It's their way or the highway, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm pausing to model the use of that strategy, <laughs> which, you know, it's kind of funny to, to point out, but I think that's I may make raising that as it's important, you know, for us, first of all, to pause, to give ourselves a chance to think um, there's good science behind it. Not only does it work, but there's science behind it. You know, our front part of our brain, our uh, prefrontal cortex is our thinking part of the brain. It's also the slowest part of the brain. So it needs time to think. And so giving ourselves that space to just okay. take a breath and to think for a minute, maybe I break even break eye contact and look off into the distance to think for a second. Because uh, we also know that that typically is a good indicator yeah. of thoughtfulness is breaking that eye contact. And then paraphrasing. So. So it sounds like Melissa, we're, um, you're noticing a struggle in society or maybe your family or community and folks aren't really listening to the heart of the message that they're conveying. Yep, that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, we have to understand each other. And just because I heard your words doesn't mean I understand them. Yep. And so by me paraphrasing back, it does two things. First of all, it helps make sure that I understand. And number two, it helps you know that I understood. And, and if, I, if I don't understand, you have a chance to correct it. And then, and then the thir that third skill of posing questions, you know, being able to say, okay, so this is important to you. So what are some things that you're thinking about um, that you have done or or might do to increase understanding of people that you come in contact with? If you're posing the question to me, I would say having these podcast interviews with people that are mm. in different type of um, communities and different type of um, careers and actually hear, letting other people listen to in on them as well, mm. because we never know what the next person's going through. Mm. So, so it starts with, with getting different experiences and yep. their voices in the room, so to speak. Yep, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. That is so I don't true. know if you noticed, but just by me using those three skills, like my blood pressure has gone down, like my breathing rate has decreased. Um, like there's just a more calm, and I'm not saying that the first 20 minutes of our conversation was really, you know, <laughs> off the rails. It wasn't. But there's a different thing that mm -hmm. happens when we pause, pose, and paraphrase. And I, I hope I hope your um, listeners can can hear that in our voice and in our inflection. Well, we're talking about pausing and posing and paraphrasing. Let's um, take a quick Great for our sponsor. You just sort of segued that right in. So here you go. That was perfect. Schools closing their doors again this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic is devastating for students, parents, and educators. Beyond that, it has disproportionately challenged low resource school systems, further revealing educational and health inequities among communities. Teachers and parents are searching for tools that will enable schools to reopen but many of these solutions are expensive and time consuming. To ease the magnitude of challenges faced by high need school districts, we can provide a simple solution that has a deep impact. I'm Della, the founder of Nestle Space. Nestle provides easy, beautiful health-centered design that adapts to any environment. We design products that are attentive to bodily experience, emotional health, and ergonomics, including our portable, touchless handwashing station. Our handwashing stations bring running water anywhere with an outlet accompanied by ergonomic design. Because no plumbing is required, our portable stations can be placed in classrooms, gymnasiums, lobbies, libraries, and beyond. The CDC has identified handwashing as a critical mitigation measure for schools during the pandemic. However, as evidenced by the high number of schools that have reached out to us over the last six months, Many schools do not have prolific access to running water in classrooms and in other areas which they need to repurpose as classrooms in order to increase social distancing during the pandemic. 
We know schools are short on resources, dollars, space, and time. We can help, but we need your help to do so. We'd like to supply our Nestle Kids hand washing stations at no cost to selected public schools in need. Our first goal is to distribute these to 10 school districts. We are asking for your help to simply cover our production and shipping costs. Together, we believe we can help students more safely return to where they thrive most, at school. In these crazy times, we thank you for considering this and for your generosity. We believe that by helping support each other, we can make a positive impact in a very hard time. Again, thank you for your support. We hope you and yours stay well. And we're back. Now let's talk about how schools and um, parents should handle COVID during this time of pandemic, because there's a lot of pressure, not only on the teachers, because I have several friends who are still teachers that they're like pulling their hair out and parents as well, because there's a lot of parents that are, you're, they're having to juggle when the kids are going to be in school. Kids aren't doing their schoolwork the majority of the time. So how should they handle that? Yeah, it's, it's a real struggle on many fronts. Like we've got the, the right now issues of, okay, how do we, like you said, you know, I'm a parent, I've got my kids and they've got to be doing their work and they're not They're you know, there's like this right now immediate concern. And then there's also this more long-term concern that uh, you've started to hear more and more about is the um, quote unquote learning loss of students. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in terms of the short term right now, um, that's a challenge. I think, um, you know, the more we can work together as community, whether that's with my neighbors in my neighborhood, with other resources, with nonprofits, et cetera, to help partner with each other, to help meet these immediate needs. Um, the more we do that, the better off we'll be. Um, and I'm thinking about a project that I led in the uh, Ames Community School District, where we partnered with the PTOs from all of the elementary schools, the uh, noon Rotary Club, or maybe it was the morning Rotary Club, I don't remember which, it was a Rotary Club, the transportation division of the school district, which is a private company that was contracted with the district, and um, the, the public library. And these four organizations with the school district got books in the hands of kids geared towards their reading level, their interest level, and um, free books through all those means. Um, I'm a believer that if we've got needs and we identify those needs, that together we can accomplish that. And so that was like just one example. We got two and a half thousand books out in the hands of wow. kids, um, about five, 600 kids within a very short period of time, just to be able to meet those needs. Now, there's other needs too. Like you said, you know, my kid's not doing their homework or they're not getting online. I think the same processes can work, working together to figure that out. Um, it's a challenge. And hopefully with the, uh, the uh, inoculations, the vaccinations happening, we're about to turn the corner. Let's hope on that. So that then leads us to more long-term issue down the road. Um, and that is the so-called learning loss. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I think of with that is, first of all, let's take a deep breath. Um, there, I have personally taught and know of good friends who lived through wars mm -hmm. and refugee camps without any education whatsoever for years, four, five, six years, during their most formative times. And guess what? They not only turned out okay, but they thrived. Small mm. business owners, uh, good pillars of their community, strong, wonderful people. And so the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, yes, there's quote unquote learning loss, Let's take a breath here. Let's yep. look at the long, big picture here. To be able to read on grade level, I'm using air quotes for those who are listening and not able to see, on grade level is a made up term. Some educators got together in a room at one point and they said, hmm, what should a third grader be able to read? Ah, they should be able to read this and this and this and that completely made up. And, and then over the course of the last 10 years or so, then we've added college and career readiness to these standards. Mm -hmm. And so we went to university professors and said, university professor, if your kid, if our kids graduated at the end of 12th grade, would they be able to take your chemistry class? 
Oh, no, no, no. We got to have a higher level of chemistry that they need to have. English teach professor at university, if the kids were coming in, and I'm please don't hear me knocking university professors. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, university professors have a certain level of expertise that the rest of us don't. No. Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of us don't need that level of expertise. If I'm going into chemistry, then I better have a certain level of chemistry expertise or English or whatever. But the vast majority of us don't need that. So not only do we have standards that were invented, then we artificially raised them because we went to experts who have high expectations and artificially high expectations about what people should do. And then every five or six or seven years, students start performing too well on the tests. And so we go in and we say, oh, ooh, they must not be hard enough. Make the standards higher. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so if we understand this is the environment of reading, quote unquote, or math, mathematically computing mm -hmm. or whatever, choose the standard area, it's all made up anyway. So let's breathe, let's focus on the well-being of these kids, and then let's get us back on track over time. But it's not gonna be solved overnight. It's mm -hmm. gonna take us some time. And I would also add one final bit, is that these kids, I, I heard on, um, I don't know, CBS Sunday morning show the other day or some show, maybe it was the evening news. They, they referred to uh, this generation of kids as potentially a quote unquote, lost generation. Mm. And I thought, how terrible. I hope I never hear that term again. Um, first of all, the whole idea of self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how terrible to refer to an entire generation as a lost generation. Let's, let's get rid of that term right away, I think. And, and second of all, these young people are learning things that we could never artificially create. Like the importance of these relationships, like resilience, mm -hmm. like perseverance in the face of these difficulties. I mean, like a, a selflessness of oneself. Like I don't wanna wear a mask, but because I love my fellow human being that I've never even met, I'm gonna wear a mask to protect them, right? I mean, these skills and habits of persistence and perseverance and resilience and selflessness and service to others and a greater good, we would we try really hard to create those kind of uh, mm -hmm. environments to teach that. These kids are getting it naturally. And so God bless them. I think I think they're gonna take us places we never thought possible because they're learning things that we, we couldn't uh, imagine teaching them through books. That's true because my um, youngest daughter was actually last year was a senior in high school. So she was one of those uh -huh. seniors that was affected mm -hmm. by COVID that they didn't hardly have any, they didn't have prom, they didn't have graduation. And she, when they did decide to do graduation, she's like, I, she opted not to do it because she's like, I want everybody there. It doesn't mean anything if my sisters can't come. Cause we have um, one of my daughters is in California right now getting her PhD. So, and I'm in North Carolina. So it's hard, you know, there's family mm -hmm. traditions. It's hard now. So, yeah, 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 that just that lesson, just that one lesson by itself of how interconnected we all are as human beings and, and as a, not just human beings, but as creation on this planet mm -hmm. is like a really powerful lesson to learn. And, and they're learning it. We're all learning it. They're learning it as a, in a formative ages that hopefully will carry on as they as they move on through life. So what are some of the tips that you can give? I know stress, stress relief, especially for teachers, because they are stressed out. I mean, yeah. like I said, one of my very best friends is a teacher and she is like stressed to the max. Yeah. So dealing with that pandemic, some of the tips. Yeah, some of the tips. Um, so my first first tip is is don't forget to breathe. Um, I'm, you know, I, I kind of said that jokingly earlier on, but but really it's it's really important. And to breathe um, from you know I mentioned I was a vocal music director, but down deep in our abdomen, uh, I've got a friend of mine that says, okay, let's take some deep cleansing breaths. Um, and they are literally cleansing both at a mm -hmm. physiological and a psychological level that the cleansing breaths allow us to create space in our body for us to exhale that, that tension and stress. So that's one of the first things that comes to mind. A second thing that comes to mind is to create boundaries. Yeah. Um, 
like the people who, you know, I see you've got an office space, people who are watching me, they can see I've got an office space. Um, it's not healthy for us to, even though we can take our laptop with us to the living room and the dining room and the mm -hmm. bathroom, <laughs> right? Don't like yeah, cut don't. it off. You know, um, I work really hard myself. You know, I'm at work by seven thirty most days, and um, I five thirty that I hear the news come on in the other room, and I I shut down if I'm even if I'm in the middle of something. That's it. Um, occasionally, there's an evening meeting here or there, but for the most part. There's the boundaries. That's it. Um, same with your weekends. You know, it is. Don't be proud of working too many hours on the weekend. Cut it off. Um, now, some people will say, "Well, well how am I going to get everything done?" Done. Um, there's some things that just aren't going to get done, and we have to be okay with that. Um, if your, you know, principal isn't okay with that maybe need to have a conversation with them or look for a different school where they do want the teachers to be collaborative. My experience is most principals that I work with are good, good people, mm -hmm. hardworking people who, who are not intentionally stressing out their teachers. <laughs> <And so, laughs> not intentionally stretching. Out. It's happening, right? And, so, and we all have unintentional things that we do. So, uh, you know, if if you're in one of those situations, go talk to them and use these skills of pausing, paraphrasing, and posing questions, um, and work about okay. So how can we? We know that the needs of kids need to be met, and we know that if teachers aren't um, their needs aren't met, the kids' needs aren't going to be yeah. taken care of. <laughs> there's a there's a book in uh, for those of you who aren't educators listening. There's a book. It's called Feed the Teachers or They'll Eat the Students. Oh, I love um, that. <laughs> You know, we've we've got to take care of the adults in order to meet the needs of kids. And so, if you're in one of those environments, uh, talk to your principal. Talk to call me up, text me, email me, whatever. You know, we'll do a coaching conversation, and I can uh, help you work through what are your situation, what are your issues. I'm more than happy to uh, help folks out to figure out best ways to move forward. Now we're, um we're all connected. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Now, on the flip side, what about the parents? Because I know in my experience that when you go to a principal or you go to a teacher and they say, Johnny did X, Y, and Z, what are you going to do to fix it? That the principal or the teacher or whatever, they're going to shut down because they're going to be on the defensive. I learned, mm -hmm. especially when my daughter was in elementary school, my youngest one, because she had a lot of health issues. Um, I would go to the principal, even though I worked at the school, I knew how to approach her. I'm like, okay, this is what's happening with oh, Gracie's my youngest daughter. This is what's happened with Gracie. This is what I'm doing. What can we do together to make the situation better? So some tips for parents for stuff like that, because I know a lot of teachers and principals have a lot on them. So when parents go in and accuse them, they're not going to get the best response from them. Yeah. Yeah. I think you hit on something really important is first of all, uh, so two things come to my mind. I guess today is a two thing kind of day, you know, <laughs> everything that I have to say, there's two things that come to mind. Okay. So two things come to my mind. First of all, uh, the approach that you just took, I think is really helpful to be able to go to the teacher and, for, and work your way through the quote unquote chain of command, you know, always start with the closest to the problem. And that is the teacher, right? And so going to the teacher and saying, Hey, here's the problems I'm noticing what do you think about these? Um, or are you seeing similar things? Or how can we work together uh, to create this us environment? Because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it, it's not an us versus them. It's an us and us. Mm -hmm. um, together, we all have the best interests of our kids at heart. And so let's work together to do that. So that's the first thing that came to mind. Um, the second thing that came to my mind, I forgot. So <laughs> we'll have to come back to that later, I guess. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> It'll come back to you. <laughs> It'll come back to me. I'm sure it's really important. So uh, uh, yeah, what was the second thing? Uh, Just let you working mind. together. Oh, yes, I do remember the second thing. Okay, so the second thing is using what is uh, referred to as third point communication. So you and I are points one and two in a conversation. 
So a third point is another point. So what a third point does is it depersonalizes our communication. Mm -hmm. So if you and I are having a conversation about our, you know, your child, I'm the teacher, you're the parent, and we're having this conversation about the child, it can very easily become a you versus me thing. Mm -hmm. And we wanna avoid that. We wanna have it become about helping our child. And so using a third point is helpful. So a third point can be a assignment or a mm -hmm. test score or a test, but it's actually a physical, you know, sheet of paper. I got a sticky note here. That's the biggest thing I've got right now. Here, <laughs> you know, so here's here's the test score that uh, Jimmy got. Tell me about on these items here that he got wrong. Tell me about how I can help support him or how, mm -hmm. how um, what he needs to still learn to be able to do this. And now we're talking about the test and not you and I or some abstract thing. And so using third point is really a very helpful tool in any interaction. Same, you know, same with your spouse, you know, or same with your children. Instead of being in conflict on a personal level, get a third point. Yeah. And I will say that does work because when my daughter, Michaela, who's now, she's in her senior year at college um, in interior uh -huh. architect school. But when she was in first grade, her teacher like met with us in the middle of the school year and said, look, she's not on grade level. She's not where she needs to be reading wise or anything. We really need to think about holding her back. But here's what we can do to try to get her to where she's at. And so it was great because we well, not only did we get a tutor, but she had a volunteer that would come into the classroom and she would all, always have her pull out pulled out to help her. So and then we also got she got diagnosed with ADHD, which that medicine helped as well. But just that whole everybody trying to work together to make her succeed or to help her succeed, yep. not make her, but help her succeed. Mm -hmm. um, that helps a lot. Looking at it like a team instead of, like you said, a you versus me type situation. Yep. Yeah. And my guess in those conversations, the conversation about she's not reading the words per minute or whatever, they were actually looking at some data mm -hmm. and saying, here's right. Here's here's the 105 sight words that she should be able to read. She's reading 20 of them. Here's yeah. the letter sound that she should have. She's getting this many of them. Here's the right. It was all based on a third point that's, that depersonalizes the conversation. Yeah, that's true. And I will say that one of the things that I think is detrimental to kids is is having, you know, before we were able to request teachers is requesting the same teacher for the same for all your children, because every mm. child is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, this is very true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all three of mine are so different. It's really different. <laughs> I'm uh, the oldest of three children myself. And my parents would always say, if you could have three opposites, they had three opposites. <laughs> Mine's pretty much one, one is one is in science. One's getting her PhD in environmental technology. The other one's interior architect. And the third one, I consider my creative free spirit type girl, you know, that just kind of goes with the flow and she's really, but doesn't think she's, you know, her art's good enough, but her art is amazing. So. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, three different, and and they're all wonderful and beautiful in their own uniqueness, right? Yep, they are. They are solely different, but that's the whole thing. Is I think a lot of parents see the first child, and then they go, "Oh, well, she did such a great job with this teacher. Let us just continue mm -hmm. on with all the other ones." And it did. It doesn't always work that yeah. way. Yep, yep, that's very true. I remember with our uh, boys. We have two boys. We can see them up here in the pictures behind me. Um, going into first grade in particular that, uh, you know, the first one had a first grade teacher who was perfect for him. And we knew that with the second one, that that was not going to be perfect for him. And thankfully the, the school also saw that and, and they both had the exact perfect first grade teacher they needed. Uh, and their styles were very different. Yeah. It's amazing how they can be raised in the same environment, but all be <laughs> totally different. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> very true. So you said you started writing the book during the pandemic. Would you always, were you always teaching webinars and things like that before that? Or did the pandemic kind of spur on? Yeah. So the book was partly written before the pandemic. And then, uh, then when the pandemic hit and then, uh, you know, last July, then I jumped in at full force going, you know, and thinking about, okay, 
how does equity play into this? How do you think about these things with remote learning? So that's where that went into full play. Um, as part of my work um, as a central office leader and before that, before that as a principal and professional developer, I did a lot of work uh, in doing trainings, not a lot doing it through the technology. And so that's been a real learning um, for all of us. And I do have to say it's it's been an enjoyable learning for me. I think I've learned um, ways to engage people in meaningful learning, even though we're not face-to-face. And and I've experienced those that were not <laughs> like you know sitting for an hour or two or three hours going uh, listening yeah. to someone read their slides to you right yeah um, and so uh, so so while I had some experience with training or I had a lot of experience with training had some experience doing some webinars and things like that uh, it's gone to a whole new level yeah. uh, during the, the the pandemic yeah yeah. And and I look forward to being able to get back to more of the face to face. Although um, I think the um, convenience is the word I'm looking for. The convenience of being able to do like you know a five week um, in the middle of a five week uh, class that we meet one and a half hours each week on Zoom, and there's people there from Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, uh, Michigan, Iowa, Nebraska, and Texas. There's no way you could do that no. um, face-to-face. And so it's just a really great and opportunity to engage in the learning with each other and to build new relationships and learn from each other. You know, yep. uh, They s- tell me all the time that some of their favorite learning is happening in those breakout rooms when they're with those same three or four people really getting to know each other and sharing experiences and learning with each other. Yep, that is so true. And, and you get to also meet people that you would have never met before. And you That's learn yeah. to brainstorm, like if you're having a problem in your own school district, brainstorm, like, hey, this school district did it this way. Let's see if yes. we can work and do that. So I love that. And and real, you know, realize that we're not all that different. <laughs> you know, even though you're in Minnesota and I'm in Iowa and you're in Texas, um, you know, we all are confronting very similar issues uh, all over the country and all over the world. I've been able to uh, coach um, some principals um, in other countries and the one I'm thinking of right now in India and Mm -hmm. the challenges are very, very similar. I'd say the same, but you know, that may be a stretching it, but the ideas work everywhere, right? These ideas of how do Mm -hmm. I get to know people? How do I build relationships? How do I make sure that I'm pausing and paraphrasing and posing questions? Like these are universal across the entire planet. Yeah, that is so. So are you active in the school system now? Or are you just doing this now? I am consulting full time now. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do lead some visits. Uh, Cognia is an international accrediting uh, organization. And so I lead some school visits with them, which gets me into schools, um, quote unquote, into schools. Right now, it's all virtual. Um, and then, you know, by doing the trainings, once those get started up again here this summer and fall, then I'll be back in schools. But I'm not employed directly by a school district at this time. So did you decide, OK, now I want to launch this on my own? Or did you did you have that idea in your mind when you were working with the school district and say, you know what, I'm tired of, you know, nine to five every day. I want to be able to go out and enjoy my life a little bit. Like you said, you were empty nesters. So did that come about when you started to become an empty nester? No, no, it didn't come out until, uh, so So I was the in Ames as the executive director of elementary education uh, immediately after, you know, that whole epiphany of, of being an empty nester. Um, and then it, what, what uh, during my time at Ames, I realized that I either needed to be a superintendent of schools or do consulting, one or the other and uh, toyed around with both of those ideas and uh, then decided that, you know what, the the consulting route is something that I've been playing around with in my mind for a number of years um, and it's just time to do it. And so, um, you know, the book was at a point where it could move fairly quickly to press. And so let's do this. So, so yeah, that's it, and it wasn't a, uh, I wouldn't say it was a nine to five type of thing, because actually I think I probably work more now than what I did. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, I'm, I'm on call at any time for anyone to be able to, you know, when you're doing your own business, 
um, yeah. it's you and it sink or swims based on you. And so, um, I, yeah, it definitely wasn't because uh, I was, I was tired, uh, if, if you will, being, uh, in a central office role. That's, that's not the case. You just decided to take your knowledge and expand it to the world. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. That was a nice paraphrase. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Now let's talk about, um, getting your book published because I know a lot, I have a lot of people that like are thinking about writing a book. And so we'll just do a little side note on this. How did you go through, how did you find a publisher and all this stuff? Yeah. So um, this again, like I had big chunks of the book written over the course of the last several years. And uh, a friend of mine, Lee Jenkins has published for both the big education publishers, Corwin, and then also self-published. And he self-published after going to a weekend retreat with Jack Canfield. He's the author of the book, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Okay. And Jack Canfield told uh, Lee, my friend, that unless you can guarantee that you can sell at least 10,000 copies of your book, don't even think about going to a publisher, mm. self-publish. And so Lee, having published with publishers, said to himself, holy cow, 10,000 books. I've never sold 10,000 books and I'm you know, with these major publishers, maybe I should self-publish. And so he did, he self-published and um, loved the process. And so I you know, called up Lee and said, okay, so tell me your thoughts about publishing with the publisher and self-publishing and, and went through the pros and cons and this and that and um, decided, you know what? I was gonna go the self-publishing route. And so um, he had uh, someone who helped guide him through the process, Martha Bullen is her name. Um, and she guides publisher authors through the process to be, to actually do, so, you know, like you can self-publish just on your own, mm -hmm. but to do a really good job, um, I think you need, I like Martha was invaluable to have along. Like she said, do this, don't do that. Make sure you do this, build this, don't build that. I mean, she just step by step yeah. helped me through that process. And so, uh, and then um, I also had someone do the design, the interior and exterior design. So, so what I wanted was when you pick up this book for you to look at it and go, okay, this is a, this is a professionally published book. Like some books you can tell they're mm -hmm. self-published. I didn't want that. I wanted it to be an actually good looking and content book. And so uh, Martha guided me through that process. And then Christy Collins, uh, did all the interior and exterior design. Uh, David Aretha, who does, he's um, the Independent um, Bureau of Independent Authors or something. Um, they recommend him as a copy editor. And so he did all my copy editing. And so so I, you know, hired out mm -hmm. these pieces um, to be able to, to make it go and um, just, you know, step by step and worked my way through it. And there's a lot that happens. And, um, kudos to those people who self-publish on their own without the guidance. Uh, I know I would not have been able to do it without their help because it was really, really invaluable. I mean, just lots of little, little tiny things like, you know, how many BSAC codes you can use for this or that. And what should you put in the title? Like titling the book is important so that it yeah. shows up right. And then the author pages and um, just <laughs> yeah. all the details. So all the little teeny tiny details that you really don't want to worry about. You just want to worry about the content of the book and you want exactly. to and so, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they helped me through that. And then it, they also, uh, you know, helped make sure that it gets, it's not just on Amazon. It's also on Barnes and Noble and Powell's.com and bookstore.com. So these other independent bookstore or they're, they're independent bookstores, but, you know, that also, you don't want your book only on Amazon. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you want it to be widely available to others because that's, you know, for instance, um, universities and libraries typically will not purchase from Amazon. Mm -hmm. So you need to have it on, uh, I, don't, I don't know what it's called. Um, it's an, KDP is the Amazon one, but there's the other one that gets it out through those venues. So that's an important thing to know. Otherwise, you're stuck on Amazon and that's all, all you'll get. So Not, how many I mean, I shouldn't say stuck because that's a good place too. But <laughs> <laughs> so, how many copies of the books have we sold since you published? Um, I think uh, they, you know, they say uh, that uh, the average book sells a thousand copies, um, and I've been published for four months and sold probably about half that. 
Okay, that's not bad though for, and you're getting you know, the I, I've been with it. Yeah, I'm. It, it's not they. They say from the get go, don't count on getting rich from it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really about getting the ideas into the world and to be able to to help others. And so that's really what it was about for me. And I'm sure once you get into, once we go back to whatever is considered the new normal, where you're able to go to conferences and speak, you'll be able to sell more books because then you'll have your stuff there and people can buy yep. it from you and stuff like that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Well, you have really enlightened me about, you know, education and how to, even relationships, how to talk to people. I mean, really. Mm. So is there anything before we hop off that you want to share? Any last thoughts? Any last thoughts? Um, I guess my last thought would be that we're in this together, whether we're parents or students or educators or community members or business owners or whoever we are, we're all in this life together. And so together, let's let's make it the best that we possibly can for and with each other. Yeah, that's a, that's a good last thought. Now, can you tell people where they can find you at? Yeah, probably the best place or the easiest is on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Chad Dumas, C-H-A-D-D-U-M-A-S. I, I must have gotten on Twitter early enough. There's no number or anything like that or underline. It's just, you know, <laughs> plain and simple, at Chad Dumas. And then from there, then, you know, you can look at the profile and you can get to my website, nextlearningsolutions.com and my email and things like that. So, so yeah, uh, Twitter or my website, nextlearningsolutions.com. And you said for any teachers, how about parents too that are having trouble navigating the education to email you or just parents? I mean, just teachers. You know, you know, anyone and everyone, I'm, I'm in the service business. So happy to help out in whatever ways I can with, uh, with anyone that I can. Oh, that's awesome. I want to thank you for coming on today and for just enlightening us about the education system for sure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. All right, guys, we will see you on the next chat from the blog cabin. Bye. <laughs>